Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this session. I'm excited about it. I've been interested in stewardship for a long time, and I, want, I was excited to have two of my colleagues from mechanical engineering join me to make a presentation of how sustainable engineering is a part of the stewardship for creation, stewardship of creation. My name is Bill Jordan. I'm a mechanical engineering professor. This is my 14th year here at Baylor. And my, I'll let Alex and Ken, my two colleagues, introduce themselves. Kind of the background, I want to start off by talking about <coughs> how this is different from creation care and from environmental awareness. Certainly, if you're concerned about the environment as an engineer, uh, that's important, but I see this as a much broader subject than just environmental issues. And I think it's much broader than just reducing the amount of pollution, although this is included, because even if we were to eliminate pollution from certain industries, we're still using resources that are not renewable, whether it's coal or oil or whatever, and eventually we will run out. There's controversy as to when, but eventually we will. So we need to be concerned about pollution, but we also need to be concerned about resources that are not renewable. <clears throat> so one of the things that will help this is the role of engineering. So I'm going to give an introduction, then Dr. Yokochi will speak, and then Dr. Venturin will speak, and then I will close. Our plan is to take about 50 to 60 minutes in that and have 30 minutes or so for interaction with the audience. So why do we care about sustainable engineering? One of them, which you're probably all aware of, the global population is continuing to grow. <clears throat> However, I don't think personally that's the biggest issue. It's, it's kind of sound weird to say that. I think the biggest struggle we're going to face is that global affluence is growing at an unprecedentedly fast rate. You here in Waco may not feel like they are getting richer, but the world as a whole is getting dramatically richer, and that's going to put a bigger burden on resources. And uh, that Im impact will double by 2030. That's based, that was a 2015 estimate, <clears throat> and that's based on the number of middle class income people in the world will double between 2015 and 2030. That's an enormous amount of resources that are going to be needed. And I think the only way to reduce that impact is to redesign global technology, and certainly engineering is part of it. So, uh, <clears throat> one of the things is a lot of things are happening in terms of the environment and relationship to it. And here you see some data from a, a website, anthropocene.info. Uh, you see ocean acidification, world population is growing, uh, and primary energy use is growing, and I, I had about two or three more slides of plots of this nature. One of the things that's interesting is something happened dramatically around 1950. And one of the things that happened around 1950, when I asked my students this, most of them don't have any idea, but what happened was World War II devastated the economies of Europe in particular, and certainly of Japan as well. And by about 1950, with the Marshall Plan, the economies began to recover so that there were more and more middle class people dramatically in the 50s as they came out of the destruction of Germany and Japan and really all of Western Europe. So things begin to change. <clears throat> but another thing that's really dramatic is the, this graph from the World Bank. From 1981 to 2008, the number of people who lived at extreme poverty, and they're defined extreme poverty as a dollar and a quarter a day per person, decreased by 500 million people in the world. So there, that, there's a dramatic increase in affluence. Now, it's not affecting everybody and everywhere, which is another whole set of issues. But this increase in affluence, in my perspective, is a much bigger issue than increasing population. And that's what I stay there. So one of the things that's important from an engineering perspective is what we call sustainable development. So NSPE is the National Society of Professional Engineers, has a long, complicated uh, definition. <clears throat> they may say it's the challenge of meeting human needs for natural resources and all these other things uh, while conserving and protecting environmental quality and the natural resource base essential for future development. The idea is while meeting the needs of today, we don't sacrifice the needs of tomorrow. But when I try to tell my friends in, at church or other people why I care about sustainable development, this is not a definition that appeals to anybody, very many people. I spent the fall of 
2016 at Villanova University on sabbatical, and I sat in on two graduate classes in sustainable engineering. And they put the definition of sustainable, sustainable development down into four words, and I really, really like their definition. They said it is enough for all forever. You're providing what people need, you're providing it for everybody, and you're doing it with resources in such a way you could keep doing this forever and ever. And I really am indebted to them because that's a concise <coughs> reference that we could communicate to our students, to our friends, as well as be excited about ourselves. So one of the questions is what's driving the sustainable engineering movement? Certainly, when I went to Villanova, <coughs> I thought it was largely government regulations. And government regulations do drive a lot of things. Desire to do good, there are some people desire to do good because they have pressure from their consumers. They have pressure from their employees, particularly the millennial age group. And then one of the things I never really caught on is the ability to make more money by being more sustainable. And the issue is it's not more money, it's very much more money. I was at a conference at Villanova where the main speaker said the biggest force for sustainable development in the U.S. today is Walmart because they're requiring every supplier to have a life cycle analysis of everything they sell them to Walmart who then sells it to the rest of the world. Now Walmart is smart enough to figure out if we do this we're helping the world but then we're also impressing our customers and we're making more money than ever before. So what Walmart and other for-profit companies are finding out is if you're sustainable you can be even more profitable than you ever were before. And I think that is going to help drive sustainable development in a way that just government regulations could never do. So we're not trying to deal with sustainable development, <coughs> sustainable engineering in all of its complexity. But what I want to try to do is be, do the beginning of looking at a Christian perspective on this. And uh, both my two colleagues will look at it uh, in, more, in, in a different context. But I'm going to talk about what two guys named Francis had to say about that. Uh, in 2015, Pope Francis came out with Laudato Si on care for our common home. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, this is showing my age because I was reading things like this then, in 1970 wrote Pollution and the Death of Man, the Christian View of Ecology. And you're all well aware of how different these, sort of pe these two people were. Francis Schaeffer and the Pope probably don't agree on a lot of things. I was amazed at how much they agree with each other on the environment. Schaefer says worldview is critical. He says men do what they think. Whatever the worldview is, that's the thing which will spill over into the external world. This is true in every area, in all science and technology, as well as in the area of ecology. He says it's the biblical view of nature that gives nature a value, not to be used merely as a weapon or argument in apologetics, but a value in itself because God made it. So he says we have dominion over nature, but it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. And we exercise our dominion over these things, not as though we are entitled to exploit them, but as things borrowed or held in trust. That's a typo there. What we are to use realizing they are not ours. He gives an example. Why does strip mining turn the world into an absolute desert? What has brought about this ugly destruction of the environment? There's only one reason, man's greed. I showed a couple of these quotes to our faculty a year ago in our fall retreat, and most of the faculty said that sounds like something Pope Francis would say, because that kind of sounds more liberal. You know, but Schaefer was a hardcore conservative by any way you measure it. <clears throat> but he's saying greed is part of the problem. Well, Pope Francis, uh, talks about St. Francis, which is Francis of Assisi, and there's a number of things I could add about that, but for time I'm not going to. He says that Francis of Assisi, faithful to scripture, invites us to see nature as a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. Rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and praise. I really like the close of what the Pope had to say there. Uh, so like Schaefer, Francis recognizes that motivation is critical if we're going to solve these problems. He writes, convinced as I am that change is impossible, that's a type of without motivation. And a process of education, I will offer some guidelines for human development. 
to be found in the treasure of Christian spiritual experience. The Pope weaves three different arguments throughout his encyclical. First, he says his recommendations are consistent with prior Catholic social teaching. Since I am not a Catholic, I cannot assess that part of it at all. Uh, he says he believes his recommendations are supported by good science, which I think is largely true, uh, but not my main point. And he says his recommendations are supported by scripture, with which I really agree. So the Pope says, we are not God. The earth was here before us and has been given to us. Nowadays, we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute domination over other creatures. That sounds a lot like what Francis Schaeffer had to say about dominion. He says, this responsibility for God's earth means that human beings endowed with intelligence must respect the laws of nature and the delicate equilibrium existing between the creatures of this world. He continues to say, believers themselves must constantly feel challenged to live in a way consonant with their faith and not to contradict it by their actions. When people become self-centered and self-enclosed, their greed increases. The uh, exemplar of a, the emptier a person's heart is, the more he or she needs things to buy, own, and consume. So I don't endorse everything he said in Laudato Si. I think some of his things were a little silly, trying to tell people who live in a hot place like Texas not to use air conditioning. I'm going to give up a lot before I give up air conditioning here in Waco. But the point is, <coughs> Even if you're not from his faith background, I think there's a lot of interesting and useful things. <clears throat> and again, what really amazed me is how Francis Schaeffer and Pope Francis are in substantial agreement about how we need to change our motivation, and once we've done that, we could begin to do the hard work, because neither of these guys obviously are engineers. But they recognize that if we change the motivation, we can make a difference. So Christian faith gives many insights, I think, into the problem of sustainable engineering. It is critical if we're to be the proper stewards of our planet. There are issues of technology, but we first got to be motivated to use them. One of the things, as I hang out with conservative Christian circles, many of whom don't like this word, who words climate change, and uh, when I, the more I talk to people, the more I realize a lot of that is not because of climate change, but because of they don't like solutions of big government that have been proposed to solve it. But I think as more conservative, Christians realize that there are also market-based ways to deal with sustainable development. I think you're going to see a lot more conservative Christians uh, begin to be involved with sustainable topics. So at that point, let me give you to Dr. Yokochi, who will bring up his thing. We'll answer questions uh, uh, we're on schedule once we're all three finished, and we want to interact with you as much as you want to interact. Uh, I'm going to take like a minute to change talks, so... I can do that while you introduce yourself. I can. Well, you okay. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Who are you? So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Alex Yakochi. I just moved recently to Waco uh, to join Baylor University. I was on the faculty at Oregon State University in chemical engineering for about 20 years. Okay. Uh, and I've taught a course in something that I used to call sustainable engineering for those 20 years, and there was always a set of lectures I never was able to do. One of them was, what's the Christian motivation for engineering and for sustainable engineering? Okay, I, I, always, had to, I always had to start one step after that, because it, with, with it being a, a secular, you know, that it was a state school, so it's a state land-grant school, it needed to be a very agnostic sort of class, all right? So, I, I, I could only accidentally say things like, you know, how wor the world is designed and how the world is intended for us to use, and then allow the students to extrapolate to conclusions, right? So, hopefully engineers, they're okay at extrapolating to conclusions from incomplete data. So, I'm approaching this talk, and I probably should have looked more at the program to, to do a uh, something that's more consistent with the title, but, but here's what I put together is, is my motivation for stewardship of creation and the worldview that goes with that and what does that have to do with engineering really, okay? So, so I first had to go and think more about this word stewardship, 
Okay, and what I got from you know just a quick web search says that stewardship is supervising or managing something. Okay, in particular, it's the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Right? I think that we can all agree that that's what stewardship is, whatever you're reading, and and obviously the connection here. The immediate connection here is Genesis 2.15, where the Lord God took people, put us in charge of the garden to work it and keep it. Okay? But also, you'll notice a couple interesting things. We were put here to work the garden even before the fall. Okay? So working is not punishment. Working is something that we get to do no matter what our state is and to keep it. So that's where I got the bit about stewardship of, of God's creation. Okay? Um, there's a second one. So the land is not to be sold permanently because the land is mine. So the Lord says the land is his. It's not ours. He didn't give it to us. We just live here for now. And we are his tenants. Okay? As tenants, we have a responsibility to return whatever we were entrusted with in good condition, All right? So be good, good stewards of whatever we're, we were uh, entrusted with. So there's the connections that I see right there is we have, we have a, a responsibility to take good, you know, to, to be responsible managers of what we were entrusted with, okay? So then I had to think about what is it that we were entrusted with? Okay, so God created, you know, so there's creation. God made creation. God created creation. Okay, it's a bit tautological, but there you go. Uh, I'm a foreigner, by the way, so I, I, I use bad English all the time. It's a privilege that comes with being a foreigner, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so thinking about that, there's two things that are eternal in creation, okay? There's God's word, and we are very explicitly told that God's word endures forever. Uh, first Peter 124 where he's quoting Isaiah yeah and says all flesh is like grass and its glory is like the flower of grass the grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever okay so that's that's a good thing to consider that the you know God's word remains forever we also know that people and specifically their souls are eternal that's one of the main things that we need to, uh, to, to, to care for as, far, as part of, of creation. So stewardship of creation, as far as I, I can see, means being good uh, stewards of, of God's word and being good stewards of people. Okay? But there's one third piece which kind of connects with the sustainable engineering bit, which is people have to exist somewhere. Okay? Unless you're a physicist, we don't declare that, you know, we imagine people existing in an airless, frictionless vacuum, all right? People have to exist in an, an actual environment. And so, you know, we, we must remember, again, going back to the previous slide, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, okay? So we need to create a nice environment for the people to live in, all right? So thinking about this, okay, think about God's word, we should be good stewards of God's word, we should be good stewards of the people, and we should be good stewards of the environment. Okay? So, therefore, I'm thinking that, <clears throat> you know, just summarizing what I had, we need to be good stewards of God's word, faithfully transmitting God's word to our children. I guess, given where we're at, transmitting it faithfully to our students. Okay? And everybody else. Okay? And so, uh, you know, Everybody else in the world is our friends and relations, okay? Uh, we need to be good stewards of the people, so we should work diligently to redeem those to, um, uh, to the kingdom. And we should be good stewards of the environment, keep a useful environment for the people to live in so that, um, you know, so that they can, they can uh, uh, have a... a have an enjoyable life and, you know, be able to work for uh, the glory of the kingdom as, as they're able to, 
Okay, and so I'm sorry, I know that Ken and Bill were kind of confused probably about the background of this slide, but each time that I see the word, I, I just put friends and relations the first time, and I actually grew up reading these things, and so that's rabbits, friends, and relations right there. Okay, so I guess that's probably a student right there, uh, that's their head advisor, and I always like that bug for some reason, so I probably that bug right there. Okay, all right, so thinking about this, um, when you think about the environment, okay, and, and that's, you know, the first two are, are kind of self-evident. You think about the environment and people usually think about the natural environment, okay? This is where I came from, by the way. When I think of the outdoors, that's what I picture in my mind, okay? Rainforest somewhere, temperate rainforest that you have to put all your, um, all your rain gear if you go outside, okay? That I was just walking here a little, a little while ago with my umbrella closed and everybody looking at me like I'm crazy. I was like, what, this isn't real rain, right? This is, just, <laughs> this is just mist, okay? So anyway, so this is what a lot of people think is the environment, okay? Gotta remember that this is also the environment, okay? So there's a, the natural environment and there's the built environment, okay? People live here sometimes. People live here most of the time, okay? This is, by the way, like a really high-tech environment. There's versions of this built environment that do not look like that. Okay, we'll get to that. So, um, you know, you need to build housing, transportation. You need to supply people with water, food, energy. Okay, not necessarily all the energy is to like little street um, uh, advertisements. It can be used for a lot of other things. We'll talk about that as well. As part of the environment, you have to think about wastes, right? Not only do you need to bring wa clean water, you need to bring in food, you need to get rid of wastewater and garbage, okay? You also need to ensure that you have a pleasant environment for all so there's other things that you can think of, all right? So, so in summary, I think that the engineer's worldview as far as this, as, as this you know, environment goes we try to engineer this as little as possible, have as little impact out there as, as possible, and engineer this for a maximum quality of life. All right? So I, I stole a quote, Bill used a bunch of quotes, I stole a quote from an engineer that basically explains the engineering worldview, okay? This is a, Theodore from Karman is a famous aerodynamic, uh, aerodynamicist he invented all kinds of wing profiles and things like that. Uh, he says, scientists discover the world that exists, okay? Engineers create the world that never was. So we take that fundamental science and we use it to build buildings or build power plants or build wastewater treatment plants or whatever there is, okay? So then thinking a bit more about this built environment, okay? if that's what we're trying to engineer for maximum quality of life. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay? And yes, we'll acknowledge that Maslow was an atheist, but he wasn't com always completely wrong, all right? And part of that hierarchy of needs, there's a the fundamental need there, uh, physiological needs, food and water, okay? Until people are traveling in outer space and we'll add air to that, okay? Um, we have safety, so a pleasant environment, and then I'm just lumping all the other, all the other levels in the hierarchy of needs into one. So the belonging, esteem, self-actualization, whatever that means, okay? Engineers, my kind of engineers, mechanical, chemical, civil, that sort of people, we kind of worked on here, okay? And that's the scope of the traditional um, engineering activities. So we try to get food and water and energy to people. We try to design a safe and, and, and healthy environment for people to live in. And that's actually one of the big things in engineering right now. My professional society is all over the water, food, energy nexus. Okay, and it's, it's not only in engineering, the UN, FAO, and everybody else is, is, you know, has recognized that as being a key for what we do. So here's the, that energy, water, and food nexus. Okay, so, Clearly, you need water to grow food, okay? It's almost enough, okay? If you have water and you have some soil, you can actually grow food. 
And if you don't have enough water, you can import food. And so actually food transports embodied water. That's how we export water to severely water uh, limited stressed uh, countries like Kuwait. Okay, we don't send them water to grow food, we send them food. Okay, so here's a picture that shows that. This is a desert in Libya. Okay, so again, Gaddafi was a bit of an idiot, but he wasn't also, also completely wrong all the time, all right? Turns out if you irrigate the desert with all that water they have under the Sahara, you can grow food in the desert, okay? Um, and yes, if you can't irrigate the desert, then you import food instead of importing water, okay? Um, you need energy to grow and process the food that we consume. Okay? That's natural, you, you need farm equip, equipment and all that. A lot of people nowadays are looking at food as biofuels to produce energy. Okay? That's, a, that's a difficult question right there. Is all the corn that we're growing useful for biofuels or should it be used to feed people first? Okay? I don't know. So there's a picture that kind of embodies that, which is you know, a corn field, there's some farm machinery, it's grown for biofuel. Remember that the farm machinery is actually a tiny fraction of what the energy that you use for agriculture is. Most of the energy that you use for agriculture is actually, uh, is actually natural gas. We basically eat natural gas, okay? Because we take natural gas, we make hydrogen out of the natural gas, we convert the hydrogen to ammonia, and then we drop the ammonia in the fields, and that's, that basically increases the, the, the yield of the fields by about five to eight fold, okay? So imagine if we didn't have artificial fertilizers, you'd need to eliminate about two thirds of the human population, okay? So those people think we can do without that, uh, you know, I, I've, got, I've got something to share with you, right? And then down here, we need energy to lift and treat and move water, okay? And we need water to make electricity, turns out. Okay, it's, it's, it, it, it's a, an essential ingredient. And that's the picture that I chose, and it's, it's not really clear what the picture is. So this, I actually chose a picture that's the construction phase of the Carlsbad desalination plant. Okay, so that's actually an interesting example, but that picture isn't quite clear, so I, I like process flow diagrams. So here's a process flow diagram for what's at that site, okay? You take seawater, the seawater goes, there's an intake, goes through, this is a natural gas fired power plant. And you dump the, you reject the wasted heat onto seawater, the seawater makes it, its way back to the ocean and it just carries away the excess heat so you can start the cycle again, the, the steam cycle again, right? As part of that, you actually are diverting about 100 million gallons a day of seawater through a reverse osmosis desalination plant. It uses a bunch of electricity. Out of there, we get 50 million, million gallons a day of desalinated water, okay? Stuff that shows up in your pipe if you live in Orange County, okay? That's part of what you drink. The, the remaining water, the brine that you have is 50 million gallons a day of, of, of really, you know, twice as concentrated as seawater. Okay, so that water just gets mixed with these 500 million gallons a day, so it basically it barely increases the salinity of the water, gets vented into the ocean, and you just don't have to worry about it, right? So you can see that you make energy here, you consume energy here, you make water here, you consume some water here, so the whole thing kind of works, right? So that's why that kind of made sense to me, okay? Even better than that, if you think about wastewater, Okay, I'm a chemical engineer, by the way. I think about, I could train students to make water and, and treat wastewater and just make a living out of that. That's almost what I did at Oregon State, okay? So here's what you do. You take some sewage and you treat the sewage and you have some anaerobic reactors and some filtration and, and, and settling. Eventually you push that water through some kind of, of a constructed water, uh, a, a constructed wetland and you vent that into a, a polishing pond and then that goes off into a river, okay? So that's what we do a lot with wastewater, okay? 
Here's what happens to the water. It starts in as raw sewage is not a pleasant thing to play with. Okay? But as you go down the stream, it just gets cleaner and cleaner until what you're venting out in the environment is water that's about as clean as, you know, lake water. Again, if you live in Southern California, in, in Orange County, instead of this pond right here, actually, instead of this whole thing, you put in a whole bunch of membranes. Okay? And you take those membranes, you take that wastewater, and you polish it to drinking water quality. Okay? So that's part of what you drink if you live in Orange County. That's almost 100% of what you drink if you live in Singapore. Okay? In, in Orange County, because there's, we have such a, you know, we, we have this issue with treated sewage as potable water, okay? This feces thing in the water kind of drives people crazy. So what we actually end up doing is we take the water, we inject it into the ground, it percolates through an aquifer, and then we extract it like a couple miles down the road, and it's gone from being treated, treated sewage to being groundwater. Okay, and groundwater, all of, all of a sudden, semantically, is clean enough to drink, all right? So that's what you do if you live in a, in a highly developed country, okay? So we have super high technology that, yes, you could take sewage and you could make drinking water out of that, okay? Most of the drinking water that we find is not that. Most of the drinking water is like stuff that we take from a well or from a lake and we, f we add some flocculant and we, we, we settle the flock and then we filter it a little bit and we add some chlorine or some ozone to disinfect and that's what comes out of our pipes. Okay, again, I used to teach this. Trivial stuff to do. Okay, undergrads could learn how to do this, All right? There's, two, there's over two billion people in the world that do not have access to improved water. Okay, and they just use water directly from the environment. Sometimes it's water that's a lot closer to the, to the raw sewage in that table that I showed you than the, the clean polished water. Okay? So instead of this, it turns out that there's a different technology we can use. Okay, it's a few hundred years old. It's called a slow sand filter. Okay, for this slow sand filter, what we can do is, is we can build a little filtration device here with you know, there's large particles, stuff that looks like gravel, stuff that looks like coarse sand, stuff that looks like sand, on the surface of which you grow a little film, a little biofilm. It's actually bacteria just growing there, okay? And if you pour environmental water on there, it just accumulates there on, on that top surface. That so top surface actually chews up all the organic contaminants, and the water that comes out is potable water, okay? Good quality, you know, it, if you go to Central America, you'll still get traveler's disease, but it won't, you know, it won't give you typhus, right? Um, so that's a technology that, that, that is, this is like the low end of technology. This is a technology that you use and you try to spread around the world to help people have a good quality of life. All right, so this is engineering instead of engineering for the developed world, this is engineering for the bottom two billion people in the world, okay? The people that Bill is hoping are going to go from utter poverty to some kind of quality of life there, okay? Um, I've always been inspired by a friend, okay? It's a friend of one of my nephews who has made, his career choice was, I am going to build these things and I'm going to deploy them in Guatemala, in, in rural Guatemala to treat water, okay? So this is what they do. They just pack one of those things up, and they're made of concrete right now, so those things are really heavy. They just pack those things and they cart them to a village somewhere in the, in the mountains, and they just put it together, and partly, of, partly what his motivation for doing this is while he's there, you know, they're building that and establishing the the biofiltration thing and all that, just takes the time to then share God's word with the local people as well, okay? He's had a huge amount of impact just doing this because all of a sudden the little kids are not getting sick. They're actually showing up to school. So they're creating a problem for the local schools. There's too many students in the local schools instead of having the kids sick half the time, all right? Um, and so he's, he's having a, a, an impact in people's lives out there. If you want to know who he is, 
just go to this website, hishands.ws, and you know that's that's what he elected to do with his environmental engineering degree. Okay. And so, in summary, okay, thinking about from my worldview, what does engineering have to do with the stewardship of, of creation? I think that we're commanded to make a better environment for all. Okay, doing our work diligently. So we're, we're basically Jesus showed the example. So he, he says, "I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do." Okay. So if we do our work diligently, we can we can attribute that we can assign that to God's glory and the outcome that comes from there. Okay. We should care for all in the name of Jesus. Okay. Uh, this is actually one of my favorites. The King will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Okay? So we have a clear mandate to care about these two billion people or however many there are. And while you're doing it, share God's word. Okay? So we know that God's word does not come back to you empty. It accomplishes whatever it was that it was intended to do. Okay? Remember, it's not necessarily your job to close the deal and, and get them into the kingdom. It's your job to be there and be willing to share the word. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, eventually use this and try to make disciples of all nations. Okay? So, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. You're rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay? So that's what I've got for you. It, hopefully it kind of relates to the topic some way or another. Uh, so thanks, and I'll pass it off to, to Ken for his, uh, his thing. Sorry, I'm being incompetent here. There it is. Where is yours? Right. This one. So yeah, I'm Ken. I been at Baylor 20 years now. Uh, spent 21 years in the Air Force before that, so I think I'm ready to retire, hopefully a second time at some point. But, uh, this is why I'm here for these kinds of things. Uh, I'm an engineer, just like the two gentlemen who spoke to you before, uh, but we're, there's more to us than just engineering. People tend to think we're just kind of one-dimensional, but we do like to think about things. And I've got a presentation I'd like to talk to you about engineering stewardship. And I think you're going to hear some of the same words, and that shouldn't surprise you that you know, we did these three individually, but you know, you're going to hear some of the same words. And hopefully, I'm going to put a little bit of a twist on it in terms of what we want to do as engineers at Baylor. So, so those, that's what I'm going to try and cover uh, in the next 20 minutes or so. Hang on, okay? Hang on. So just like every other engineer, we have to ask questions, and we have to define things, and I needed to do that too, so I'm going to define what an engineer is. Now this is interesting because most of our freshmen who come into the program can't give you a definition of engineering, but they know they want to be one. So, so we need to know what engineers do, that's important. What is stewardship, that's important. What is sustainability, because that's all tied up in what we're doing, as Bill pointed out. And then, what do we mean by creation? I think that's an important word for us also to look at. What do we mean by that? So, first off, what is an engineer? I could ask you that, but uh, I, I won't embarrass you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to put this up. I got this from that repository of wealth of knowledge, Wikipedia, right? Uh, we always tell our students, don't go there. Hey, it comes up first on the search almost every time. they got a pretty good... Uh, web people there, but uh, it's really quite good. Engineers, professionals who invent, design, analyze, build, and test machine system structures and materials to fulfill objectives and requirements while considering the limitations imposed by practicality, regulation, safety. Can't hardly say that with one breath, but that's really what's embodied in engineering. Let's break it down a little bit more. We apply principles of science and mathematics. So we learn a lot of those kinds of things but we really enjoy applying them and making things with it. Uh, we're going to try to develop economical solutions to technical problems. It's a link between science and maybe commercial applications. And here we go at the end, too. We're meeting societal and consumer needs. That's what we're all about, trying to meet societal and consumer needs. And, I, and again, I really like this because it's just like Villanova. It's simple. 
This is what engineers do, and I try to make sure my students understand this before they graduate. Right? Engineers make things to improve people's quality of life. That could be on any level. It could be in the developing world. It could be in the developed world. But that's what we do. We love making things and improving people's quality of life. So that's an engineer. So what's stewardship? Hey, this should look familiar. We have the same dictionary. <laughs> Responsibility for overseeing and protecting, right? Caring for what, what's worth preserving. And managing someone else's property. Now, when we get to a definition like this, anybody could embrace that definition, right? Christian, non-Christian, anyone could say, that's stewardship. Yeah, I buy that. That's okay. So, so let's move on. What is sustainability? It's an economic activity that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of the future to meet their needs. Anybody could embrace that definition. I mean, we haven't really, we, we just embody what it is. That's what sustainability is. If I want to look at a, another way to, it's the avoidance of the depletion of natural resources to maintain an ecological balance. That's the one we're mostly involved with, or we're most familiar with, is this whole environmental issue, right? Resources, we have to maintain the resources. And then I'll put up here what Bill put up, because I really like it. I've been to Villanova too. Wonderful place, they're doing a lot of good work there. Enough for everyone forever, basically is what that is. Enough for all, forever. And that's something you can remember, and you can wrap your brain around it. And, and you can teach your students and teach your family about those things too. So that's sustainability, enough for all or everyone forever. Okay, so here we go now. <coughs> we talked about motivations for this. Well, creation. What is creation? And when you look at this, this is again, dictionary tells us this, the act of producing or causing to exist, the act of creating. Okay, now thank you, Webster. Okay, the fact of being created. Okay, so far so good. And everybody can agree with that. <coughs> Something that is or has been created. Okay, I can agree with that. The world, the universe, people refer to the world as a creation. Creatures collectively, but this is the one that makes it different. And you'll find this in the dictionary as well. This makes it different. The original bringing into existence of the universe by God. So now we've mentioned God. And that sort of puts this in a little different light. And that makes it just a little different compared to what someone who's not a Christian, how they would look at creation. This is really what I want you to take away with. And you've heard this word before this afternoon. What you believe about creation directly influences your worldview and your motivations for stewardship. That's key. That's key. So how do Christians approach worldview? Well, worldview is the same for everybody. It's an intellectual framework that interprets our experience and guides our activities. Right? We all have one, whether we know it or not. It's the sum of everything that we've had up until this point. We have worldviews. Now, here's where it comes from. A significant portion is formed from the cultural narratives that are embedded in one's learning and nurture environment. So far, that's pretty generic. <coughs> that's pretty generic. But what makes that a Christian worldview? We draw from the narratives of the Old Testament and the nation of Israel and the New Testament accounts of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That is the difference. That makes this a Christian worldview and that makes our motivations different for what we do. So how do Christians approach worldview? If one believes concerning creation, there it defines who one is in their Christian faith and their concept of God. So that really, it boils down. If you believe in, in God and creation, then that really flavors everything that you believe and how you look at the whole world. That's key. That's key. It forms the basis for worldview. <coughs> that's what we just said. But here's the, here's the kicker. If we look at how we interpret the Genesis story and creation, there's a whole lot of different ways that people this is the one that has no God, right? And there are people out there that don't, they don't believe God, have anything to do with any of it. Right? 
So that would be an atheistic evolutionist kind of person. Here's an intelligent design. We're not saying the word God, but we're talking about the world being created by an intelligent designer because we look at the things around us. Okay? People would say, well, yeah, you're really talking about God there. But, yeah, okay, so I didn't say the word God there, but you might infer that. There are uh, people who talk about theistic evolution, that, that God created and allowed things to just progress, uh, and, and God is involved with that. Uh, that's one way to look at it. There's the gap theory, where we put geological ages into the Bible. And here's progressive creation, where we created along the geological ages. Those two are kind of linked together. And then, of course, we do have literal six-day creation, which also includes what people would call the young earth creations. So how in the world are we going to agree on anything when all of these things are out there and people come from different worldviews to how they view the world and how it's made? It becomes very difficult. So typical engineering curriculum. Now we're getting, we're getting point our fingers at ourselves here at Baylor. Uh, we provide few opportunities for reflection and analysis. We're so busy getting our students, hey, Give you an equation. Here's a calculator. Here's some numbers. Put it in here and get an answer. And our students love that because they do like to get right answers in those kinds, of, especially on tests. We like that. But, but that's what we tend to give our students the work to do, to sit there and learn these engineering principles and apply these engineering principles. But we don't always ask them to take that step back and look at what that has to do with the world or where it came from, the things that we're studying. Creation must be a starting point, I think, for this conversation that we have with our students. And how that informs engineering education, especially here at Baylor, this is an important thing. The problem is, with such a diversity of ideas, that agreement on anything is next to impossible. And, and believe me, we have a whole gamut of these ideas here at Baylor. And so if we get hung up on all that, we've lost. So, so there's some issues there that we, we have to work out as an institution, but uh, this, this is something that we deal with. So uh, Steve Eisenbarth and I, a number of years ago, struggled with this because he was a Presbyterian and I was a Baptist. You know? So we had some, some differences and things that we were doing, but we agreed on the main points, which was really quite interesting. But uh, Presbyterians are a creed, you know, they have those kinds of things, and Baptists aren't. But we decided to sit down and said, if we could come up with a worldview for engineering, what might that look like? And we came up with this. As a Christian, I believe in the triune God and the personal redemption of the individual through the cross of Jesus Christ. God created the universe, of which I am a part, and that these beliefs, coupled with the knowledge and skills developed through the engineering curriculum, motivate me to live a life God would have me live, engaged in the vocation of engineering, the calling of engineering, and to make a difference in the world. To us, that summed up exactly what we want our students to walk out of this institution with. Something with which they can frame their lives as they move on. And, and this is key down here. Uh, engaged in the vocation of engineering to make a difference in the, in the world. Because we are motivated to live the life God would have. Simple, and yet hard. Hard to actually put into practice. So what's Christian stewardship? Well, I put a Christian spin on the word stewardship. Follow the belief that human beings are created by God, created the entire universe and everything in it. To look after the earth, and thus God's dominion, is our responsibility. As a Christian, that's where we should be and what we should be doing. If we look at it, we are God's creation. And this is something we tend to step back. We always tend to think of environmental kinds of things. But we are God's creation. And we have to be stewards of the resources God's given us in our personal life. And that includes time, talents, and treasure. Not just the environment. We have to make sure we take care of ourselves as well. And that's, that's hard sometimes. It's hard to say no, but we need to do that occasionally. Um, as Alex pointed out, God owns it all. So, so yeah, we are in the right perspective when we think about the fact that he's entrusted that to us and we have to take care of it as stewards. Now, this is out there, environmental stewardship theology. Okay, And, and it's not 
terrible when you look at it on its surface. Caring for creation is a way to worship God. We don't worship the creation. We worship the Creator. But that can't be to the exclusion of everything else. But that's important for us to understand. Now, the reality is, if you look at this, most religions do have some form of ethical responsibility for the world. So we're not alone with what we do. And that's key for us trying to work with other people in different areas. So, so remember that. Uh, and the bottom line that I think we have is this must be a way of life. If we're going to talk about Christian stewardship, it has to be a way of life, not just something we talk about on a Wednesday afternoon. It has to be that. So why stewardship? God commanded it. We've seen this before. We have dominion, and we're to take care of everything, but it, God, God owns it. We have finite resources. Now, God's not making any new worlds that we know of, although Elon Musk wants to go to a couple different ones, right? Uh, he's local here, for those of you who aren't from this area. He has his rocket test facility at McGregor, not too far from us. You may hear it if you're outside at certain times. But, but basically, yeah, we have, we have finite resources. And we want to be responsible for the next generation. We want to make sure that the resources are there. So, so that is our desire to do good. We do have government involved, uh, as Bill pointed out, too. And we do have regulations. Some people are trying to get rid of regulations. Some regulations are trying to put more regulations on. But we have to deal with those when it comes to our environment. This is one that Bill pointed out, but it's also one that I came across with the thing that, look at this, greed, thoughtlessness, lust, exploitation, short-term profit, right? All of this is because people want more stuff than other people have. And that's that middle, we have to be careful with that, not let that overpower everything that we do. So where do engineers and stewardship inter intersect? Stewardship is exercising our God-given dominion over creation, Reflecting the image of God and, and uh, His care, responsible, maintenance, protection, beautification of His creation. Good. Christian worldview. This becomes where they intersect. Worldview can help engineering students, and everyone else too, by the way, evaluate the relative significance of potential career choices. Where do you want to work? Do you want to build the, the, the filters that Alex showed us down Guatemala? Yeah, that, that's a valuable piece of work if you want to do that. Maybe you want to build F-35 fighters up in Fort Worth, too. How does that all mesh together? We want our students to think through those things. What kind of an industry do you want to be a part of? And where do you want to spend your life and make a difference for God? That, that's what we want. I'll be honest, a lot of our students struggle with these kinds of issues. But they don't struggle with them a lot until they leave here. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think we ought to be presenting a lot of these kind of alternatives to our students before they graduate. <coughs> Let them talk through these things before they face them when they walk out the door and go to work for somebody. So, a well thought out Christian worldview. That's what we would like our students to have. Now environmental stewardship, you'll see a lot of that. Uh, we talk about it here quite a bit in this conference. But churches have gotten on board. Uh, there's an evangelical declaration of the care of creation. I don't know if you knew that, but it's out there. And it's pretty along the lines, you would think, uh, that, that this title says. And then I dug a little deeper, and I'm, I'm Baptist, and I didn't even know they had this. Southern Baptist Declaration on the Environment and Climate Change. I didn't know they had one of those, right? So we need to get this kind of stuff out in front of people so they see it. There are books. Bill showed us a couple of books, 1970 and, and today, modern books. It's spanned all that. Here's a couple. I thought the titles were kind of interesting. Saving God's Green Earth, Rediscovering the Church's Responsibility to Environment Stewardship. And I always love this, 50 Ways You Can Save the Money. Right? People just run out and buy those because 50 ways has got to be easy. I just do one a day for 50 days and I'm, I'm in good shape then, right? So, uh, But anyway, so, so these things are out there. And a, and a lot of churches are getting on board with Christians as well. So how is this different than a non-Christian? How do we approach this different than a non-Christian? It really isn't that different. We have the same challenges, but it's already been pointed out. We have different motivations. Right? This comes from Engineer 2020, Visions of Engineering of the New Century. All of these things are things that we can get behind. It doesn't matter whether we're Christian or not. We can do that. That's not a problem. 
Here's the National Academy of Engineering. I only picked a few of the grand challenges that they have, 14 of them they have, but these are all things that, yeah, we can get behind those kinds of things. That's not a problem either. Right? But we do it for a different motivation than maybe someone who isn't a Christian. We do this because we're trying to protect God's environment and be good stewards to do those kinds of things. We need to figure out how to work with government and environmental groups. Government is not Christian. I wouldn't think you would agree that it is, right? So, uh, so, so we do have to work with it, right, and within it. And there are a bunch of environmental groups that we would say aren't Christian, but yet have the same kind of ideals that we would want to do in terms of the environment. Let's figure out how to work with those, right? Now, uh, politicians, we're in an election cycle right now, for those of you who haven't figured that out, I actually voted today, long story, but I got in quick to do it. Uh, I remember watching the 2008 uh, election debates, right? And when the presidential candidates got up there and started talking about energy, I'm just going, really? Who's, who's filling your brain, you know? None of that stuff's right. And it, it just really gets you to the point where something's got to be done. And we started a course, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes to, to help with that. Here's one that we don't talk about. And this is what Bill kind of hinted at. What must we sacrifice to achieve this environmental responsibility? Hey, I'm not ready to give up my airplane. I like my car. I'm not ready to do those kinds of things. But maybe I can be more responsible in the car I drive and the things that I do. Uh, and, and that's where the mindset has to come in and the change has to happen. Uh, change is tied to economic resources. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you can make money and you can make more money with them. And then how do we achieve this consensus? That's really the key. How do we work together with a common goal? Christians, non-Christians, everybody. Because we do have the, the same goal to preserve the world and the resources. So how do we approach it? A good engineering program, a Christian worldview, we want to engage our students. Now, we've always talked in the past about this cradle to grave kind of thing. Okay, yeah, when we build something, and then when it, when it comes out of service, what do we do with it? But we haven't really talked about the next step, this cradle to grave to cradle. How do we recycle things? Then we use the resources, and I think that's become a part of now engineering that we need to emphasize more. Christian engineers, we do call what we do a vocation, as most people do, walk out of Baylor. Uh, this is what God's called us to do and built us to do. We need to make sure that what we do promotes good stewardship when we go out and do it. And for us as Christians in Baylor, our pedagogy needs to support this Christian worldview and to help students work through these issues. Not to tell them what to believe, but help them work through the issues so that they come up with their own Christian uh, worldview. And of course, that's exactly what we need. Nurture, nurture the environment, and, and put these ideals into the engineering curriculum. So, so how do we do that here? We, we've done a lot of things here. Uh, this is a course that I, after that 2008 election, that uh, Ian Gravani and I put together, and we had NSF funding for this, National Science Foundation funding. And basically, we wanted freshmen coming in to learn about energy and society. And we had them from all across the, the, the data, political scientists, we had um, you know, English majors. We had some scientists as well. But everybody needs to know about energy. And this was an interesting course. We did this for four years. Uh, and, and then it was just not sustainable. Right? It's the sustainability thing. Uh, engineering electives, we have a number of those things in, in Baylor uh, that include these uh, ideas. Uh, we have some energy exhibits over in the Mayborn Museum that's here on campus. We have an energy room that we put together for them so that people can learn about solar energy and, and wind power. Uh, we do independent study and research in these kinds of things. And of course, we also have a humanitarian engineering bachelor of science in our engineering program. So that's all stuff that we've done. There's more, but that, that gets us good. And of course, every university is into recycling. And that's a visible sign that people remember. Hey, easy to do, just do it. So. Here's an example of, of personally how I get involved. I'm interested in energy, so I, I got involved with urban wind turbines, right? So here's urban wind turbines, an interesting factoid. 75% of all generated power 
uh, in, in, in the cities is, is used by people who live in the cities. That's, that's huge. So why don't we generate power in the cities? We don't do that. We do it out west Texas and have big power lines that bring things in. So, so we need some smaller wind turbines for power generation that work with the lower wind speeds. Right? In the urban environment, we're trying to get more efficient wind turbines and ones that are quiet because these can spin up to 2,000 RPM. And that's pretty noisy if it's outside your window and you're trying to sleep at night. So you don't want that to happen. So we're, we're working on those kinds of things. We're also looking at Waco. Waco has 10 miles per hour wind, average wind speed. West Texas is 25 miles an hour, and that's what they designed the wind turbines for, 25 miles an hour. You take that wind turbine and bring it to Waco, it doesn't work. We've had people buy wind turbines, put them up thinking they want to be green and visible, and then they complain their wind turbines don't work. So, so what can we do? We can design them with the, the proper blade, the proper twist, everything, and, and when we do it correctly for 10 miles an hour, we can get 100% more power at that wind speed than a commercial turbine can. That's amazing. We, we want to try and commercialize that at some point, but we haven't really done it. So this is one small example of the kinds of things that we can do here at Baylor to help in this area. So conclusions. Stewardship, important for everyone. And these are the reasons. We've seen that. As Christians, God tells us to take care of the resources on a personal level and on a global level. So we've got a lot of responsibility on our backs. And just remember, it's more than just environmental. We can tend can, can get hung up on that, and I think there's a lot of environmental kinds of things here in this, uh, this conference as well. Uh, with the environment, Christians and non-Christians do have common goals. We have different motivations, but we must find ways to work together. And lastly, on us, as engineering faculty, we need to help prepare our students to be responsible stewards when they walk out the door and see the things we're going to face. So, thanks. I'm going to give a, a, just a few more comments to kind of close us because we want to have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to skip a few slides to, uh, from a time perspective. Uh, one of the things that Alex and I didn't really mention <coughs> was the fact that we also teach courses that deal with this subject. Alex teaches the generic, I, I don't say generic, the general sustainable engineering uh, course. I created a, a graduate course and a slash technical elective for seniors. I'm teaching in the middle of this fall and reflect in my materials background, it's corrosion and sustainable metallurgy. So it's, it's assuming you have some a general commitment understanding of sustainability and <coughs> what you may go on to do it. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we've done in the developing world. When we use technology, generally speaking, societies and cultures that have more technology uh, will be better off. The problem is sometimes well-meaning people try to put high technology into developing countries to show that move them ahead faster, and frequently that does not work. We make, when I, we go on engineer mission trips, people read a book called When Helping Hurts by Corbett and Thicken. Problem is, lots of times, <coughs> well-meaning Westerners go to the developing world and do things that result in things being worse rather than things being better. So we need to be very careful how to put high technology into the developing world. One of the few play ways that it has exploded in ways nobody anticipated is cell phones. There are millions and millions of people who have cell phones who do not have electricity in their home. They've seen that the cell phone allows them to communicate with potential buyers and sellers of their goods if they're a poor farmer. And what that means is they go to, into town every week or two to the cell phone charging station. That's not a business that would make much money here in Waco, you know, because we just plug it into the wall. But that's an example of where high technology has been accepted and adapted in ways people wouldn't have expected. <clears throat> but I want to describe to you a few things we've done working with students. When we went, we've gone to Haiti a number of years. One of the things we did in 2015 is set up several cell phone charging businesses in rural areas of Northeast Haiti. <clears throat> what we did is we put together a kit that was a solar 
uh, no, solar panel connected to a battery uh, system and with some controls. <coughs> and we provided that to, the, to some poor businessmen who would then pay a fee back to our group over the years as they made profits. And that's proven to be successful. Uh, so the idea is that the for-profit companies will provide a service and help the local economy. So here is an example of a location. We put it in, I believe, here's the cell, the solar panel. We put the business into this building. It doesn't look like a big business building to most of us. Here we had a celebration of, a, at the end of it, and, and where we celebrated that we put this in. Basically, we, our group spent about a week putting together these five kits, and then we spent a day at each location putting it in, trying to create a business that is sustainable. <clears throat> One of the issues is how can you use high technology in a place where you may, may or may not be <clears throat> appropriate. One of the things you should think about as engineers is the implementation may not be high technology, but high technology can be used in the design phase. And I think a clever example of that was uh, when we were in uh, Rwanda. Musanzi, Rwanda, what you have here is a school, this and here it's on a hill. Here's the water well, but up here and up here is where they want the water for that's where the cooking is. So they needed to pump it up. <clears throat> so the question is how big a pump do you need? One way that we could do is, this is a picture, if you go to Google Earth, you can find it. Now this is a few years old, they've completed this portion. But from Google Earth, we could measure the elevation here to the elevation here, without leaving uh, Rogers Engineering Building. So that's an example of using high technology. Then the question is, how much does the sun shine in this place? Well. With modern technology, uh, they use software that I'm not familiar with how to use by electrical engineering friends, our transist. They model the solar radiation because they could find out how much sunlight do they get in Musanzi, Rwanda, again, without leaving here. So this is an example where really high technology can be used where the final implementation is a relatively simple pump, you know, and uh, a pipe that goes up three, 400 feet in length and maybe 20 feet in elevation. So one way you could help people in, in, in poor parts of the world is take advantage of the technology we have here, but not necessarily install that technology, but use that to solve a problem. Because what they need to know is how big a pump do we need to get a certain volume of water based on the number of kids up that hill. We could do that calculation here. One of the things we've done a lot of times is we have not always been successful in what we're trying to do. So why do people like me want to keep doing this? Uh, one of the things is I think we're making a difference in local communities piece by piece. But the other thing is our students are being transformed in ways that no one, they could not understand before they went there. Uh, a friend of mine has started a group called Bridge to Rwanda which does Christian economic development in that. <clears throat> and their theme verse from Bridge to Rwanda is one that I've kind of adopted for my own. I've been to Rwanda five times with Baylor students, three times to Haiti, once to Kenya, and once to Honduras. And their slogan is, we want to build a bridge from the U.S. to Rwanda and change people at both ends. The idea is we want to make a difference in that community, but I assure you, a middle class uh, Texan who spends uh, just two weeks in Rwanda where the median income has doubled from $1 a day to $2 a day, that sounds terribly low, but I've seen in the years we've been there a dramatic transformation. Rwanda is rapidly improving economically. But the point is $2 a day is extremely low by our standards. And we've had testimonies from students, so I wanted, rather than give you all the details of the engineering, a couple of students. This one uh, said, this was the greatest day of my life. An example of how we did not go to a touristy place uh, is these students in Rwanda had never seen a black American in person before. They're well aware that African Americans are in our country because many of them knew a lot more about the NBA than I did. But he was mobbed uh, everywhere he went, you know, and he had a great time. The students loved seeing someone who kind of looked like them too, yeah. So that was valuable as well. Here's a student with a, a more detailed one. <clears throat> he said, there is little doubt in my mind that the lives of both Bader team members and students were completely transformed. Uh, he goes on to say, we went there as a team of individuals, 
but whose lives have been changed. We gained invaluable experience in another cultural landscape and gained knowledge of dealing with the circumstances present in developing countries. This particular student, now alumnus, is working full-time as an engineering firm, but because he was excited about applying faith to engineering, he just got this last summer his seminary degree. He'd been working part-time in the evenings and on weekends, and he now has a degree from Fuller Seminary as extension program. So that's an example where this student was already a committed believer. This transformed him into saying, I really want to make this part of my life. So kind of conclusions, I think this appropriate technology can help, but which is the right one to use is not always helpful, is not always known. And again, we must install or use this in a way that does not hurt. And again, entrepreneurship can help in promoting sustainability. You need to have a sustainable business on the ground who can keep doing this once you finish. So I skipped a few slides because I wanted to give you all some time to interact with us and ask us questions. I'll just say uh, one other thing as an example what Alex said about the water <coughs> filter. We put a water filter like that. We built and put one in in uh, northeast Haiti and the local people weren't sure it was going to work because they'd never seen it before. So we as engineers and engineering students experimented on ourselves and said we're confident it's going to work. Watch us drink this water for a week. <laughs> Nobody got sick and then the local community bought into it. Okay, so you can ask questions or comments aimed at any of the three of us. I appreciate the chance to come here. This is a subject, as you can see, Ken, Alex, and I are passionate about.